This is the Weather Lounge here at Weatherworks. Well, hello, friends, and welcome back to the Weather Lounge. I'm your host, meteorologist Brad Miller, and our podcast comes to you from our Weatherworks headquarters here in Hackettstown, New Jersey, and made possible by Crew Tracker Software. And joining me, as always, is my good buddy and co-host right here in the Weather Lounge, meteorologist Mike Mahalik. Brad, we are back. We are back. <laughs> for another podcast. And hey, I think we got a good one coming up this time, too. Yeah, you know, we continue to draw a good audience for these weather term podcasts. Mm-hmm. So here we are with part four, believe it or not. But this one is fully dedicated to everyone's favorite season, winter. Yeah, I mean, it's... <laughs> I mean, who doesn't like winter? It seems no, like it no. seems like every weather weenie there is out there <laughs> loves to talk about snow. I ninety five snow coming at you. <laughs> That's right. That's right. But we thought, hey, it's we need to know these winter definitions too, um, because if we don't, you know, it's just good to know for um, your own knowledge uh, of what these things are. Um, so we are going going to invite another guest uh, in with us here today. Our and favorite, our favorite producer. <laughs> yes, our only producer. And I was going to say meteorologist Mike Priante. Mike, our favorite producer, like Brad said. I, I think Brad said the only producer after that too. <laughs> oh, I think yeah, that's I more realistic. I mean, you couldn't get anyone else here. So yeah, I know. Um, but yeah, it's good to be back, and um, you know. Glad to uh, be back on <laughs> Man, the weather he lounge. So excited, I know, doesn't I know. mean. <laughs> well, you know, some of these weather terms, we, and we've done, like I said, three of these. Uh, so some of them are repeats. It's okay because you know we kind of want to revisit as we get into winter, though. Yeah, no, it's always good to do something like that. But uh, Mike, since you're here and you're so chipper today, well, um, I'm in a great <laughs> mood today. That's for sure. Yes. <laughs> Why don't you take us to break and then we'll get into those terms. All righty. Well, we'll be right back after we take a short break from our sponsor. Since 2004, Crew Tracker Software has enabled snow and ice management companies to save time, money, and resources with their comprehensive digital services platform. All the information needed to plan your operations and make business decisions is current and always available. Along with QuickBooks, Crew Tracker Software provides seamless integration with WeatherWorks certified snowfall totals. Visit CrewTracker.com to rock your game and learn how Crew Tracker Software makes managing snow and ice simple. Take advantage of the SIMA Show Special $500 discount and White Glove Startup Service offer. Hello and welcome back to the Weather Lounge. Again, I'm meteorologist Brad Miller, and today's topic is weather terms for winter edition. And uh, Mike Priante, you are going to start us off, I believe. And uh, it's the uh, it's that one word that we all uh, kind of look forward to in winter and hearing from the media and reading on social media. It's the mm. buzzword, Mike. The the volar portex. <laughs> That's pretty good. <laughs> Oh, wait, I'm sorry. I, I read that wrong. Yes. It's the polar vortex. Tell us. Let's talk about that polar <laughs> Man, vortex. I'm sorry. Today has just not been a good day. I don't know. Came in, not as chipper. Now I'm reading words wrong. I mean, yeah, I don't no, know what's Here going we go. On. Here we go now. We are ready to go. Let's All right, do this, let's Mike. Go. Polar okay. vortex. Talk about polar it. Polar vortex. Tell me well, when it's going to hit my house. Well, here's the thing. That's one thing, too. Um, a very uh, misleading uh, thing is that the polar vortex actually stays put wherever it is. And it's up in the the poles. So up in Canada, it's basically this large, basically the vortex, as you could call it, it's kind of a counterclockwise flow of air. Um, it, Like I said, it doesn't really move from where it is. Um, it's kind of just sitting in place. Now, it does break off and pieces of it, lobes of the vortex, lobes that you like that word? I like that word that's a good that's a good description you're right <laughs> yeah they, they actually break off and they like go down into lower canada and they make their way into the u.s and there's been a lot of outbreaks of cold air and that's been our sources of really these arctic outbreaks kind of come from the pieces of the vortex that break apart we've had outbreaks in 70 1977 82 85 89 and of course the most famous one that made the uh made a buzzword was uh 2014 and the whole, when is the vortex going to be coming down onto my house like it's a tornado, but it's not. So. Yeah, I think that's important for people to realize that it is not something that is hitting your house. Right. It, it is now, not. Things result as a, as, a, as a reason due to the polar vortex. 
Right. I mean, yes, you're going to get much colder air with the polar vortex from uh, from the Arctic. Um, it can support snowstorms, you know, providing that fresh cold air for things like that. Um, but the thing about it was I felt like when it hit the media um, in 2014 that people thought it was something new. Yeah. And um, actually, you know, like I said, it's not new. It's right. Not, I mean. We, we've had this phenomenon since the earth began. I mean, think about it. Like <laughs> and since, since weather patterns started, you yeah. know, a long, long, long time ago. Um, but no, the, uh, the actual phenomenon was discovered in the 1800s. And I wow. think it goes back all the way to 1853. I don't Holy know if it was smoke. called the polar vortex in right. 1853, but the phenomena itself was discovered. Mm. So I think it's really just the fact that, uh, you know, Sometimes the media pulls in something and, uh, you know, it, it, you know, media has also come a long way. I mean, back in the 90s, of course, most of the actual media was yeah. newspapers and TV. But now it's online buzzwords, things that pop right. out, hashtags, things go viral quickly, yep. especially now. 2014, that was almost 10 years ago. Brad, you remember in the good old days, they just used to be called Arctic Outbreak. Arctic Outbreaks. You yeah. Know? And now, you know, now they're the vortex or, outbreak. Or it was just cold. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> it is what it is these days. You gotta, you gotta go with the go with the flow. But uh, again, that's what we try to do. Also, is you know, on our social media, we try yeah. to just you know temper the the hype and just uh, go along with you know what's happening and why it's happening meteorologically. So that's that's all we can do. Of course, and uh, you know that's all I got about the polar vortex right now. If anyone else has anything to chime in, we can move on to the next term. I think we hit enough chimes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. What do you got, Brad? You know, I'm going to start off with wind chill. And everyone's heard of wind chill, of course. And, you know, it, it's, it is something that we, we talk about a lot. And it's, it's another buzzword in the middle of the winter or even really before winter starts sometimes. And, um, you know, again, it's, it is what it is. Just like the heat index in the summer. It's, it's the opposite, obviously. It's, it's, how the, it's how the cold feels on the body. And, um, you know, wind, uh, dry air, things like that, you know, that is what it makes it feel colder outside. So regardless of what the temperature is outside, you know, the feeling on the body changes based on the strength of the wind. Uh, again, what kind of, uh, you know, moisture is in the atmosphere. So, you know, cold, dry, windy, it's going to feel a lot colder than, you know, calm right. and kind of, you know, maybe foggy or something like that. Um, you know, even if the temperature is the same in both scenarios. And I think the the whole reasoning behind it is just that um, for the wind chill is that that wind is removing heat from your body. Right. So it takes it away from your skin. So that's what makes it feel so much colder um, because your body can't radiate the heat off and keep like a little bit of a warm layer near your skin and, and make you feel a little bit better. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's what the wind chill basically is. It's just a calculation on that. Right. Exactly. And, and again, the, the technicalities of it, it's, it, it does take the wind speed at an average height of five feet and a typical mm. height of, a mer of an adult human face based on readings from the national standard height of 33 feet. Wait, so a, an adult human face is what it bases it off of. Yeah. What, what about, what about a baby? Yeah. Well, hopefully baby's not outside if it's that cold. I know. Well, that's but, an interesting thing because, yeah, you, know. you know, babies are a lot smaller a lot shorter and and it's actually sometimes colder near the ground surface because of radiation um so that's actually interesting sounds like we need a a baby wind chill uh, baby chart baby chill factor baby I like chill it. factor now, yeah. now one thing you know <laughs> no. one you know one thing that actually I, I do read a lot on social media is is if the wind chill is below freezing can water freeze no and that's impossible right it, 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 the the if it, 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 let's say let's say the temperature outside is 35 but it's a windy day you got a gust of 40 yeah and you know it's your typical after a cold front goes through air mass but mm -hmm. water is not going to freeze even though the wind chill is 22 right. so again it's you know water does not affect it will get affected by this so uh you know so that's something we get we get a, a couple of questions about once in a while and there is a wind chill chart i mean they're basically everywhere the weather service actually came up with this, I guess, a long, long time ago. You can just Google it. But for example, we'll go on two extremes, like temperature of four, 40 degrees with a five mile per hour wind, the wind chill is only 36, which kind of makes sense. Now, as you move down 
in temperature, let's say the temperature is 20, you got a 30 mile an hour wind. That's when you start getting to the minus fives. And that's when it gets dangerous outside. You can't be outside that long because your skin can still freeze. Uh, and again, that that happens with the wind chill, um, like Mike was saying, because it removes any kind of heat away so from your even skin. Even though water won't freeze, your your body can still have that effect, though. Um, moving on way down the chart, you know, you're getting well, to, when it's that cold out. Yeah, right. And, you, and you're getting to some dumb numbers here because it's just so cold. But <laughs> let's say it's like <laughs> zero numbers. degrees and you have a wind of 40 miles per hour. Your wind chill is like minus 30. Wow. So it happens. Though, and you read about these things sometimes in the plains. Uh, out in the Rockies where you sure. get the core of these Arctic air masses or polar vortex sometimes, <laughs> lobe of it at least. Um, so you get these crazy wind chills out west and, and it does. And that's when the livestock are, are like in danger and things like that. So it's nothing to mess with when you get down into these uh, single digits and especially below zero. Yeah. Since we're talking about winds, I think it might be a good point to pivot over to Nor'easter. Oh, yeah. So do you know... Why it's called a nor'easter? Let who's, who's? me guess. It has to do with the holiday Easter. What? <laughs> no, not more Easter. The at nor- Easter. Oh, I'm sorry. That's the worst joke I've ever heard. It's not more Easter. <laughs> All right, and and Mike. Well, here's no. the here's the rest of my terms, and yeah. you could go yeah. ahead and exactly. read those. He's 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 cut out of this podcast. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, anyway, I'm out. Here's his mic. <laughs> anyway, but yeah, a nor'easter gets its name because coastal winds are out of the northeast during these storms, and it's really all it is. Um, That's how they got their name. Now, typically there are strong winds because we're talking about strong low pressure systems that are riding up the eastern seaboard. Um, And you have your, um, you know, counterclockwise winds around that low pressure. And that's just, you know, bringing all that strong wind onto coastal areas out of the northeast. So that's where it gets its name. But I mean, nor'easter is a big buzzword because anytime you hear nor'easter, you know, people are thinking, oh, it's going to be a blizzard or what uh, What do we got going on here? And it's true. Many of our big major storms for the eastern seaboard um, have been nor'easters. If you go back to, you know, the blizzard of 78 93, 96, 2016. There was even a blizzard back in 1888 that was a nor'easter, and that lasted for days. And it was something like 40 or 50 inches of snow in some places uh, across the northeast. Um, just an amazing type storm. I think it might have happened in March, too, um, which those is quite pesky interesting. Pesky March snowstorms. I'm sure yeah. we all know about those. Yeah. It was at 2018 when there were four nor'easters. 2018, there was, yes, there was in March, I think four in March. Yeah. One was that knocked power out of my house for about five or six yeah, days. That was, that I remember was, that one. I remember that winter. Um, so, and I don't think that winter was that severe until March. Yeah, it was, it was the pretty, pattern flipped. It was a mild, mild January, December, January, yeah. February, mild in winter in terms. General, yeah. yeah. But um, but yeah, that's the, that's the whole thing about nor'easters. So we're just talking about winds that, are out of the northeast and strong is basically what you're looking for, um, you know, to label something a nor'easter and, of course, some type of low pressure system uh, riding up the right, east and coast. all the snow that comes along with it. I mean, of course, it's uh, you know, again, but like I said, it's it's a it's a, it's a buzzword, and and you know, we always kind of quote look forward to the first nor'easter, then by you know March and even in April, we're like, oh, please, no more. Hopefully there's no more nor'easters. Now, to kind of add an extra level to that, Mike, th- there's actually two types of nor'easters. Um, and the reason I'm going to take this topic is because they're called Miller A and Miller B nor'easters. And there is a difference. Now, a Miller A nor'easter is one of those storm systems that actually develop in the Gulf of Mexico or it could even develop in the Rockies, even in the Pacific. But it stays kind of on a low southerly route, more along the southern jet, uh, subtropical jet. Until it gets to the Gulf of Mexico and then it really starts to pick up strength and energy and it slides across Florida and then pretty much right up the East Coast. And as it does so, it's again gaining strength and it's picking up more moisture. And 
usually in these situations, there's an area of high pressure somewhere in eastern Canada or maybe in the Ohio Valley. And that kind of gets stuck or maybe pushed a little bit northeast into New England. So now you got a big, strong area of low pressure coming up the east coast. You got a good supply of cold air with a high pressure in eastern Canada, maybe New England. And voila, you got a, uh, you know, a, a big snowstorm. Then this this is the kind of storm that impacts almost the entire I-95 corridor, mainly from Maine all the way down even to the mountains of Georgia. Uh, Superstorm 93 was a, a perfect example of this. Um, and that was, you know, again, that's probably one of the strongest storms that ever occurred out of this uh, kind of, uh, you know, developing, you know, yeah, scenario. Sure. I mean, that that's a textbook example. I don't think you can get more textbook no. than uh, the blizzard of 93 or Superstorm of 93. I mean, we're talking about snow all the way down to the Gulf Coast, I believe. Yeah. What about the Boxing Day blizzard of 2010, I believe? That was a mm, that was a Miller yeah, A. Was yeah, it a Miller A? Yes. Yeah, I think it was. Yeah, yeah. I mean, but yeah. Again, and, and going back to that Superstorm ninety three. I mean, the satellite. I, I'm always more impressed by the satellite of that one. It's just, it's just one of those unbelievable satellite. It's like a big comma. Oh my god! And there was severe <laughs> weather down in the Gulf uh, or uh, Florida for that one too. Not to yeah. mention all the snow that uh, came along with it. I think there were a lot of tornado out. Was yeah. was there a tornado outbreak? There was with a this? tide. There was well, a there was a storm surge. Yeah, well, because it was basically a derecho. On the west coast of Florida, right. Um, that derecho. went through Florida. I mean, those are phenomenon that usually happen in the in the plains or, or you know, diving into the Ohio Valley or something like that. But this kind of blew across the Gulf and, Coast. And we're we're going to go into more depth on this uh, snowstorm, too, because we we do have a memorable snowstorm uh, podcast coming up uh, a little bit later in the in the. OK, I'll winter, be quiet so. then. No, no, that's good. We're talking about. <laughs> so let's move on to the other type. Now, there's another New Easter, and this one's called a type B, Miller B. And this one's a little bit different because it's more of a, a system that may be gliding across the Midwest, uh, a lot weaker than maybe the Miller A storm would be. And actually what happens is it kind of dies out over the Appalachians because it's just not strong enough. Uh, but at the same time, there may be just enough energy or maybe another piece of energy that uh, forms along the Appalachians on the east side. And as it does so, this area of low pressure will start to gain strength again, but more so in mid-Atlantic. It won't ride all the way up the East Coast, or it won't really start out in Florida or down in the Gulf. This one, again, will kind of bypass its energy, or uh, I guess kind of regenerate again. Yeah, off of Hatteras, off of basically. Hatteras, and, and really, it doesn't reach its peak, though, until probably New England. But at the same time, it is starting to develop snow. Uh, it's more of a maybe Maryland northward on this kind of a system. But again, it usually peaks in New England. and. Yep. Usually with a Miller B, uh, you know, Boston, you know, Hartford, those areas, they do the best out of these storms. But same kind of idea. You got a low pressure uh, area moving along uh, the northeast coastline there. And like you said, Mike, northeasterly winds, heavy snow and, uh, you know, maybe some rain along the coast if there's enough warm air. But so again, I know in the winter of 2013, 14 was a huge winter for New England. And I believe the most common storm type was Miller, a Miller, Miller B. B storm. Yeah. It's It seemed like almost every, because I was forecasting a lot of times there, it seemed like almost every one was exploding on the eastern seaboard and then riding up to the to the benchmark, they like to call it, south of Cape Cod. Was that winter storm Nemo? Was one of them winter storm Nemo? Mm, I can't remember. I lost. Nemo was in... January, I believe, of 2013. Yeah. Oh, okay. So I, I believe it was a Miller B. Yeah, I think it was. Yeah, no, um, I, th I think it was Miller B. We, we, it seems to me like in past years to get a true Miller A, it takes a lot. It's either yeah. been a hybrid of something or a Miller B. You know, it hasn't been a true Gulf of you know Mexico storm riding right. up the coast. It's tough to get those with a pattern. You know. Well, right, because you're trying to pump up all kinds of warm air and moisture from the Gulf of Mexico, and it's hard to keep that cold air locked in on the backside of that right. storm. Right, the Miller A's are typically the bigger ones. Miller B's are still good nor'easters, but they're usually they don't peak well, as. Well, that's not exactly true, yeah, though. I, I mean, guess. you think about the blizzard uh, in 2013, Nemo, that you were just talking that's about. That's true. I mean, that thing dropped like three feet of snow on Connecticut and a lot of spots. I think it all matters on the blocking and how that's fast true. the storm is going. Because right. you think about uh, a Miller B storm. Sometimes they could just get out of here e yeah. easily. Yeah, just ride but on if out. you have a system that kind of runs into this big old area blocking, it's gonna it's gonna transfer. Yeah. It's gonna transfer over to the coast. 
but it's not going to go anywhere right. and just going to keep dumping, dumping snow in one area. Yeah, right. Exactly. Um, I don't want to keep talking about the 2013 storm because I have a lot of stories about well, that that's one right. too. We got to save that for that other podcast. Wait, wait, we forgot. You forgot one more Miller type. Miller Lite? Yeah, Miller Lite. Oh, well, that's me. <laughs> Yeah, we'll uh, we'll save that. You know what? We, that, that's that'll be the beer and podcast, uh, the beer and uh, weather podcast. That that might not be a bad idea if we get that in we'll there. Save that be for a, next summer, maybe. There, there could be. There's a lot of like wintertime beers that are yeah. out there yeah, too. Miller Lite, if you're listening. But I, I know <laughs> we were talking about the Miller A, Miller B, and then we were saying about how sometimes they can slide out off the coast rather quickly. There is a type of fast moving system. Um, Another that fuzzy I think one. Mike would like to talk about um, that is a common storm type during the yeah. winter. Yeah, the old Alberta Clippers. You know, um, is there a is there a sports team based off of the Clippers? I'm not a. I, this will show you how much basketball. I am basketball. I'm not a big basketball fan. There's, they're the Clippers, right? Yeah. Are they the Alberta Clippers? Or? No, no. Okay. <laughs> That'd be funny if they were called the Alberta Clippers. Um, Los Angeles. The Los Angeles Clippers. Okay. Um, but either way, yeah, uh, Alberta Clippers, yeah, they are fast moving systems. Um, they don't really pack a punch as much as a Miller B or mm-hmm. a Miller A. Again, they are they're derived in Canada, so they're more of a drier system, so to speak. In Saskatchewan or Alberta? Uh, let's see. Uh, <laughs> my notes here say Alberta, but it could Hence be the name. it could be a Saskatchewan it could. It could Clipper. Be. I mean, yeah. you know, they don't they don't always have to come from Alberta, but no. the reason why is again most of the the storms have originated up that far north and yeah. you know Alberta the province is pretty big. Although right. my favorite town in Canada is Moose Jaw. Moose Jaw. Yeah, there's a town up there called Moose Jaw. I remember from the uh the movie Slapshot, the name of the town is Moose Jaw. I think it's in Saskatchewan, so we can call the Moose Jaw Clipper this the year. The Moose Jaw Clipper. Yeah. Well, did you know why it's so besides the fact that it's Alberta, you know, Canada, yeah. do you Originates. know why they're they're clippers? That I don't know. Uh, maybe the ship. You're right. Ha! Yeah, the clipper ships. Because uh, back in the, in the 18th, 18th century, you know, the, these clipper ships uh, would go very fast. Uh, they were the fastest of, the, of their time, obviously. Right. Um, so uh, it was actually this term, the Alberta Clipper, because at that point they were just fast moving low pressure systems that brought snow to the Great Lakes. Uh, in the National, was it the National Weather Service or was it the uh, the, the Weather Bureau in the 1960s? I forgot when they changed mm, their name. I think name. it's still the Weather Service there. Okay. Yeah. Um, it was an employee who actually coined it an Alberta Clipper. Um, again, because calling it a uh, you know a robust area of uh, of low pressure moving out of Canada right. sounds a little too long to right, say in a discussion. Right. But Alberta Clipper just has that has that you know, and it's one of those names that stuck, and then everyone kind of knows, even if you're not yeah. in meteorology or you just see it on the on the TV. Yeah, that like, way oh, you Alberta know it's Clipper. a fast moving storm that's right. going to bring you you know maybe a couple of inches or something like that. Yeah, interesting you mentioned that, Mike, because you know clippers are known. Like I said, they are. I want to call them dry systems because that's kind of an oxymoron, but they're not, they don't have the the tropical moisture associated with them. They're, they're polar Arctic air masses essentially tied with them. So what you do get though is a higher ratio snows. So, um, you know, more of the fluffier, powdier, powdery or kind of snows. That's a tough one. I know. Sorry. Mm-hmm. Tongue twister. Like powdery, I said, this today, uh, just uh, man, off you the need tongue some here. coffee, I think. I don't drink coffee. Well, that's the problem. <laughs> Maybe that is the problem. I solved the problem Mike's, already. Mike's younger than me and the other Mike. I don't know what, what, what coffee, coffee would do to me. Maybe I'd be like one of those people that just starts bouncing off the walls and like you have to contain no, me. No, no, like, no, no, no. No? Yeah, it's glorious. You think so? <laughs> <laughs> okay. I wouldn't go that far. Come on, Mike. All right. Well, either way, uh, Alberta Clippers, high ratio snows, as much snow, you know, you get like an inch or two from such little liquid equivalent. So definitely interesting, but, uh, you know... Uh, if you want a nice, uh, easy snowfall, get a clipper. You'll get an inch or two in a couple hours, and you're done. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So let's see. What do we got next on the docket here? We mm. went from the Vortex to the Millers to the to the Clippers. Let's stay on snowstorms. Okay. We'll stay there. And let's talk about winter storm watches and warnings. Mm. So before we started this podcast, I was talking to Brad, and I was saying, what did you give me like the <laughs> hardest topic to talk about here because oh yeah you weren't in that meeting sorry mike uh yeah i i could see i was not in that meeting 
based on the topics. No, I'm well, just Let's just kidding. give these to Mike. Yeah. Yeah, let's just give uh, Winter Storm watches and warnings to Mike. We don't know what to do with that one. I mean, Mike, um, it's pretty easy, though, right? Like a watch and a warning, right? Well, sure. Although he brought right? up a good yeah. topic, though, about it. Cause... No, because, uh, well, the thing about Winter Storm watches, unlike severe thunderstorm watches and tornado watches and warnings, unlike those... Winter storm watches and warnings have different criteria right, thresholds, based right. on where you are throughout the country, sure. um, which makes it more difficult to talk about. Now, of course, you know, when you're talking about a winter storm watch, uh, you know, you're still talking about some sort of significant snow or ice, um, you know, in the next you know, 24 to 72 hours. Um, when it goes to a warning, we're talking about, again, a significant snow or ice event in um in 24 hours or less so you know that's what we're talking about there but depending on where you are around the country the criteria changes a little bit so here's for example in 24 hours if you're going to get a winter storm warning around let's say eastern pennsylvania over to new york city long island uh, something like that you're looking for a storm with eight inches or more um, in 24 hours. Um, but that changes when you go further south. So if you go down into North Carolina, the threshold's only four inches in 24 hours. So it kind of shifts around a little bit. And there's also a 12 hour threshold too, uh, for amounts of snow, you know, so depending on what type of storm you're getting, depending on where you are in the country, things shift as far as what a winter storm watch and warning is so that's what made it a little bit more difficult what would florida's criteria be <laughs> you know it's not on my map okay now now, <laughs> now again i lived right. in charleston for a long Probably time a half an inch and yeah we were under that four inch category and it's so while it was down there we got a yeah. couple of storms actually it has to be everything has to come you know come out perfect i mean you have to have the perfect position of the low cold air coming in um, but you know three to four inches of snow down there will shut down almost any southern city versus three or four inches in new york you know pennsylvania something like that yeah it's right. a nuisance snow it needs to get but people are going to move on and, and get through their, their their day usually well it's a nuisance snow up until the point where you're prepared for it because we, right, we've had multiple too. times where where even like a four inch snowfall like also depends on the time of Timing, year right yeah yeah, yeah. imagine uh, what was that one year that uh, everything got shut down in november was it november 2019 i think um it's one of those years I, I remember it well because I was down in Atlantic City for a trade show for oh, yeah. the New Jersey New Jersey League of Municipalities, and we had to come back because that storm was developing. Right. Um, gosh, I don't know what year that was, though. It might have been 2017. And I forgot exactly what the situation was because I believe, like, forecasting it, like, there was the forecast of snow but it might have been how fast it, it just came, came down in. so fast in a yeah. bad timing. It was like three, four in the afternoon and it yeah, and snarled. Actually, in the commute, we were briefing clients at the trade show I was yeah. at about the storm. And we kept telling each one of them, look, this isn't going to be a normal November event. This is going to be something that acts like it's January right. because it is going to snow so hard right away and the pavements will cover up because a lot of times in November people are thinking well it'll just melt oh yeah you know we don't have to worry about this um it'll melt on the pavements but when you get it to snow hard enough it's not going to matter it overcomes that melting rate and you still have accumulation on the roadways and i mean too you got to think too i bet they probably did pre-treat for this to some extent but when you have snow they didn't pre-treat for this i, I don't know if a lot of people did because they thought the roadways are going to melt right but i mean even if they did pre-treat i feel like the rate at which the snow was coming down was so intense that at some point you had to have gotten some sort of plow on the road yeah it, it's you certainly did but i think that that was the main issue is that there wasn't a lot of pre-treatment down Got a lot it. of people didn't do it because of the warm roadways and then it snowed so hard and it got cold and instead of keeping that layer of melted water right on the near the pavement surface it froze solid so it prevented it from being slushy which 
ended up people getting stuck on the roads yeah. because you can't really and drive on that. And the volume of people on the road, too. I think a lot of them were, a lot of folks, unfortunately, were trying to leave early. Yeah. And they got stuck in the snow, which was, it wouldn't have mattered because if they waited, they, then they, it, it's just bad. It was bad timing. Yeah. I mean, I drove home in that yeah. system and I stayed away from all major roadways because I knew. I was confident in my own driving abilities from being a plow truck driver in the past, um, but I was not confident with what everybody else was doing. So I thought if I can get myself alone on some back roads, I'll be fine. I just remember seeing all the major routes in northern New Jersey, in and out of New York City, it was like parking lots and people just were stuck there overnight. And I was telling friends like they well, my one friend had a event to go to in Jersey City and I was looking at like outside how things were going and i was like oh this is not going well and he's like yeah i mean there'll there'll be some traffic and i'm like no you will get stuck on the roads they did not prepare for this at all and you're gonna get stuck he's like i'll be fine that night he told me mike you were a hundred percent right i was stuck for like six hours i was late to my event and i got there and it was like halfway over not a lot of people went to the event because they were stuck in traffic so you know it's just sometimes these events they happen and you know, we try to forecast as much as you can, but then there's also that aspect of, will people believe you or will they, you know, people forget. It's right. funny how people oh, forget, yeah. you know? Well, that's that's always a problem. Speaking of forgetting things, I'm looking at Mike's shirt right now, Brad, and I see a sticker on there that says soft. Soft? Yeah, I see that. <laughs> it's actually part of the uh, the design. Do you, do you not? Do you not uh, I didn't know I that. I don't think it's part of the you design. You sure about that? Come on, man. You must have forgot to take that off. No, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think you're uh, I think you're seeing things as uh, you know something uh, you know my favorite wow. sticker. That's pretty funny. Yeah, I didn't even oh that. man, that that's good. You know, this isn't the first time I wore this, so I don't I don't know really? what that means. So you've been walking around with a soft sticker on nice. your shirt the whole time. I mean, I'm I'm not a softie, so I, I, I maybe I just gave the wrong signal with wearing that sticker. So I don't know. I gotta... All right, sorry, I had to say something oh, about man. that. Oh man, I didn't, no, I didn't even notice it until you just said that. <laughs> yeah, you know why? Why don't we pivot back to our winter weather topics here? It's like he just came from the dentist and he's like, "Huh, oh, I got I went to the dentist today." Or oh, I just voted. It's kind of one of those stickers. <laughs> yeah, I, I voted, voted for I voted. a Mister Soft. Oh, well, <laughs> we know that shirt is soft. That's for sure. All right, I think uh, we should. Go over to, uh, well, now that I'm in the spotlight, I guess. Yeah, might as well, Let's right? talk yeah. about uh, black ice. Yeah, so, um, you know, talking about, because we talked about the road and how pretreatment helps keep it from freezing over. What about a situation where you have essentially a wet road that just freezes up? Like snow is done, everything's melted, but then it just turns to a sheet of ice. But there's certain types of ice, obviously, because black ice, although you think about it, it's not actually black. It's, no. It's clear. The reason why it's black or it's called black ice is because it's on pavement. And a lot of asphalt is darker darker mm-hmm. colors, so you mm-hmm. can't see the ice. And that leads to problems, you know? Sometimes uh, you get this when, you know, you have big snow piles and you have, uh, you know, uh, melting and refreezing of the ice. And it, you know, it sure. refreezes onto the, the, the surface. Right. And you don't see it when you're driving. And all of a sudden you hit that patch and you go spinning. So um, something and even if you're not driving and you're walking, slip and fall cases there right there. Right. And, you know, this is some sometimes we can get a little bit fooled by it because uh, sometimes the temperature is actually above freezing. How could that happen? That's weird. I don't well, know about that. Uh, I'm serious. So here, here's the deal. So we measure the temperature usually at two meters right? Yeah. To kind of estimate where a person's head would be. Um, So that's typically where you measure the temperature. But since cold air sinks and is very close to the ground, it might be a little bit less. um, Just enough. Yes. Just a little bit under the 30 or right near 32 at the surface. So while you may have 34, 35 degrees at that normal two meters, right at the surface, you might have 32 degrees. Interesting. Yeah. And many people don't think about that. This typically happens on a night that's very clear and calm with no winds. Um, It's called a radiational cooling night. And you can get that thin layer of 
32 degree air right near the oh, surface the same and thing. still get ice forming. Yeah, the same thing can happen with frost. I mean, your official low at a station might be 33 or 34 or even on your car thermometer. You get into the car you're like, oh, it's yep. 33, 34 degrees, but there's frost all over your car. How does that happen? Because again, or on the grass, uh, again, that temperature may be just cold enough, 31 or 32, uh, and that frost develops everywhere. Just for the record, I actually knew about this. I was just... Uh... Yeah, we know. We you, we hope you know about this. Yeah, no, I'm, not, I'm I'm I I know this. So, no, you don't. Y- yes, I do. <laughs> I I do know. I do know that the reason it's like just trying to backpedal now. I hear him. Um. So you know, back to the whole idea of like salt on ice and and snow to make it to slush. Yeah, sure. It actually low it it raises the uh the or I should say it lowers the melt lowers the melting sorry, point. lowers the melting or, point lower, yeah. which prevents it from actually like so instead of freezing at 32 it'll freeze at like 20 20 yeah um so something interesting because you think like oh yeah salt's melting the snow well actually it's just changing the, the the temperature and the environmental conditions so that the actual temperature of what snow or ice melts or freezes at changes yeah so the so the salt yes makes then a solution instead of just being water it's in a solution of salt and water correct or salt water which has a much lower uh freezing point than regular water does so that's why you know you have that just like you said and when it gets even colder below 20 degrees then we usually have um uh, road crews mixing in things like magnesium or calcium or something like that to bring that freezing point even lower. So so that's why things are melting. Or beet juice. Beet juice. Beet juice sticks to the roads very well. Yeah. So that's a they Midwest like to thing, use, though, actually. They yeah. like to use that for pretreatment. Yes. Um, Ahead of time. And, um, and I'm just going to say black ice. Though, is hot, and we forecast for black ice. I mean, here at Weatherworks, I mean, it's it's a it's an actual thing that, you know, it's it's probably one of the hardest things to figure out where there's going to be black ice because and it's it's the mo- one of the most impactful. Every, anyone can get ready for a three to six inch snowfall. Right. But if you start seeing some black ice or you get some fog overnight, like you said, with a clear night and there's just enough moisture on the ground and it starts to form at three four five in the morning when people are starting to get out on the roads and it's not good when you start to see uh, bridges freeze over and it's just that thin film from anything yeah. could be from melt uh you know it could be from some leftover moisture after a system moves out and you know roads are still wet and then that temperature drops to 30 degrees in just a couple of hours so, Brad, we talked about black ice. Um, so there's a little bit of things you want to talk about with black versus white as far yeah. as surfaces. Yeah, it's a good transition to uh, another weather term that uh, we've never really talked about before, but it's it's important. It's called albedo. And really, uh, easiest way to talk about this is a low albedo is something like asphalt, something that's dark um compared to a high albedo which is like uh maybe like fresh snow uh tin foil has a high albedo anything that can reflect sunlight white surfaces white or surfaces like that. right so and and this comes into play a lot with our forecast again because you think about shady spots in parking lots you think about um especially in this in the winter time obviously because there's it's such a low sun angle uh, you know maybe and and a lot of our clients deal with this you know certain parts of a of a of a property that they may have to uh, maintain or, or uh, treat, you know, stay shady for most of the day and only get maybe an hour or two of sunlight versus maybe uh, a parking lot that gets, you know, eight to nine hours of sunlight if it's a you know nice day. So that's mainly talking about direct sunlight direct versus sunlight with the albedo, indirect. right? Right. If we're talking about albedo, we're talking about a white surface right. versus a black surface. The black surface is going to absorb, absorb more heat right. than the white surface will reflect more heat. So that's why maybe your contractor in this instance might have to work on a sidewalk, Think of a which sidewalk is white, versus a parking lot, right? Versus a parking lot, which is black. So the white surface might accumulate a little bit more than the black surface based on the heat that it's absorbing. Yeah, that's kind of what I was getting at. Which is why um, snowboards are painted white. And that's... Where and, we and even cloud cover, you know, the, the, the albedo changes with the cloud cover, too. But, yeah, the whiteboard, uh, the snowboards uh, have to be white because, you know, if you had a, a black snowboard, it would may it may absorb just enough the heat to kind of melt the snow even to a point. You won't get an accurate measurement. 
Yeah, that's that's a good one, Brad. Um, having a, that's a more scientific term that we normally don't talk about. Yeah. So good thing bringing that one up. That's hey, for sure. I, I got I got a, a question on the next one. Uh, Brad, we'll do a, a double back to back here. Any uh, I don't know if you have any uh, any good damning evidence on this next one. But uh, um, oh, my God. I just I just went. Who wants? To we 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 really need to get. No, rid Brad, of... you should you should talk about this. All right, that's fine. I'll I'll do I'll do two in a row myself. I'll do my last we're, term. Just so you know, we're not inviting Mike back. I know on this we gotta. Podcast. I thought we muted. These, we we're gonna mute his mic. <laughs> these, these jokes are pretty awful. <laughs> I used to do the jokes. Now I, I understand it. <laughs> All right, let's talk about cold air damming. Uh, another uh, another word you'll hear thrown around um, in the weather industry is the wedge. Uh, this is uh, this happens a lot. Well, the wedge. That's a wedgie. Come on, <laughs> big sorry. difference. Big I difference. I had to laugh a little bit about that when I heard the wedge. It is. Um, you know that, but yeah, I know it's funny. Ha, ha, all right, ha. all right. Let's go. Cold air damming. Come the on, wedge. Anyway, uh, a good example of this is uh, let's say it's middle of January here in the Northeast. Uh, we got an area of high pressure that's kind of over like new england so it's cold it's you know maybe below normal but it's a sunny day you know but there's a system uh, that's down in the gulf or uh, it's uh, starting to get its act together but this one isn't going to go up the east coast this one's going to kind of go up the appalachians and and we see this uh we see this a lot too uh in the winter uh, what happens is this area of low pressure starts to move north and it and it kind of moves into that area of high pressure now high pressure is going to kind of move out but at the same time the cold air that's left in there is hard to get out in the middle of winter um it kind of gets wedged in there uh especially if you have a snowpack so uh the warm air that's pushed northward along with the storm system is not allowed to really get to the surface it's pushed up above into the upper parts of the atmosphere so it's cold at the bottom of the atmosphere, including the surface, and it's a little warmer above. So yeah, you're gonna get some precipitation. This is how you get freezing rain, you get freezing drizzle, you get sleet. Uh, but the cold air kind of wedges itself all the way down the Appalachians, and it's tough to, again, kind of scour out, if you will. So what happens is you get this mixed uh, wintry mix, and, and it, may, it may take a day or two to even get some of this cold air. Sometimes it never relents, and it just gets stuck in the in the Hudson Valley and up into uh, you know parts of uh, New Hampshire and Vermont. And uh, again, this you'll hear this a lot: cold air damming. Now along the coast, you get it down you know southeastern Mass, Long Island. Uh, you know the, the warmer air kind of is able to take over a little bit faster. But as you get into the Appalachians and uh, some of the nooks and crannies, if you will, uh, the Poconos all the way down into uh you know western maryland right. uh, that cold air is tough to get out and it's stuck and uh, you'll hear that a lot so you get wintry mix a lot of times with the cold air damming wintry mix and a lot of times you get some freezing rain um in those type of situations yeah. which is usually an easterly wind and it's uh, just yuck yeah well the, yeah the the cold air is is stuck there like brad said you have the warm air riding above it rain is falling through uh, a warm layer Trying gets to refreeze, to that, yeah. gets to that cold air that's dammed in those valleys, and that's how it freezes. It doesn't have time to freeze back into some sleet. And I remember events where it's uh, freezing rain at 28 degrees, which is just yeah. that just sounds yeah. that's just as bad as you know rain at 30 at 33. You know, yeah, it's, I mean, I mean, rain at 33 is not as bad as 28 in rain, but it. You know, you could be snow. And it know? can happen yeah. outside of winter. I mean, we've seen it happen in spring, too. It's another, uh, you won't get snow or anything. But, dam- yeah, damming, but you yeah. may get a couple of days where it's stuck in the 50s in, in late April, early May, uh, if you get that pattern right uh, with that, you know, high pressure east wind, cold air stuck. So let's pivot away um, from cold air damming and let's get back to snow because that's what people like to talk yeah. about, right? You know, every, you know, I feel like ice is like, it's kind of like, um, I don't know. Although ice is more impactful. Uh, uh, yeah, it's more impactful for sure. You but can't I, do anything with ice. Well, yeah. no, I, that's a lie. You, you can, can do a keep, lot with ice. Yeah, you throw down the icers. But I mean, I think when people think winter, they think about snow. They don't think so much about those ice storms that are just, you know, pretty damaging. To I was a lot actually of thinking more about uh, like, you know, uh, like like those freeze pops and, uh, and making slushies because you said nothing you can do with ice. And I said, well, you know, there's some you play you make some snow cones and play stuff. Hockey. Yeah, snow cones. Anyway, back to snow. See, I keep trying to pivot back to snow, if you haven't noticed. Uh, but uh, um, let's talk about a snow squall. 
Yeah, we we've talked about this before, but they're again, yeah. these are uh dangerous sometimes. Yes, absolutely. Um so basically a snow squall is I like to just compare it to a thunderstorm in the wintertime, basically. You know, a lot of times you're not going to get the lightning and, and, and such, um, but you still have a brief period of very heavy snow in this case instead of the heavy rain in the thunderstorm case. So you're going to have a brief period of very heavy snow. You might also have gusty winds. And the worst part about it is the reduced visibility that it brings with it, which could be less than a quarter mile. So, and these things drop, you know, could drop a half inch to up to even two inches sometimes really fast. You're talking in less than 30 minutes um, that you can get these uh, snow squalls to drop that snowfall. Um, yeah, they're they're pretty uh, they're pretty intense. I mean, I remember this was going back a while, but uh, when I was in college, um, this was like 2013. There was a there's a we were on the top of a Walker building at Penn State, and um, we were watching as a squall came in, and you could see in the distance just a white cloud, a wall uh, of white, yeah. a wall of white heading our way, and it's and you could it's almost like a like like um like a haboob but with snow. You know, like a dust storm with with snow heading your way, and then once it hit, it just was like go to white terms one for haboob. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's true. Um, but uh, yeah, Mike's got a good point. Yeah, it's like a wall of white. And if anybody watched like uh, Game of Thrones in the past, I think there was something with the whole uh, what do they call them, the White Walkers or something. The like White that. Walkers. Yeah. Yes, and and when they came in from the north, it just looked like a just this wall. Well, of, the good thing is that there are no white walkers that, that, that are coming in with the wall of white. But the bad news is <laughs> yeah. it's still going to cause problems, especially yes. if you are driving. Major problems, especially if you're on an interstate because the visibility drops so quickly and then people start slowing down. And a lot of times it causes a chain reaction. You have slippery roads. And this is where you get those big like. 20 30 40 car pile yeah, unfortunately that you'll deadly find, deadly car accidents um which is just really unfortunate now we have been trying to get better at forecasting snow squalls and recently the weather service um started doing snow squall warnings which is certainly beneficial you'll get that playing across your radio a lot of times that's that's a relatively new warning right. um so basically that's what they're warning about these um extremely brief um uh snow squalls that are going to reduce your visibility so fast so please slow and down we of course heads up our our clients for any kind 100%. of percent anytime there's yep. snow squalls coming in you Even know if there's a snow shower we you know we're on top of absolutely, that absolutely because we know that they have to get out there and they have to treat uh their properties for it so um Sometimes we even talk about it even well before in the morning forecast yep. or something like that uh, before the snow squall arrives in the afternoon. Um, but yeah, I mean, definitely a, a, a dangerous phenomena um, and one that we're definitely getting better at forecasting. Oh, I think I think there's no question about us forecasting, you know, uh, snow squalls. And obviously the warnings have been a huge help in terms of trying to get that communication. But I still think that, and this goes back to just people's mentality, there's still an issue with people realizing like, oh, it's, you know, it's just snow, it's whatever, I could drive through it, it hasn't been snowing for hours. Visibility, just like driving in fog or in heavy rain, I mean, you're not hydroplaning, but you're basically doing the same thing, except not with rain, but with snow that's sticking to the road and lose you lose traction so there's just that thing you have to have to tell people like hey you have to take this serious you can have as many warnings as you want but you're still going to have people that think that they can outrun it and only that the temperature even drops with the snow squall i mean it may be like 38 39 you see some flurries you know it's not going to do anything but if you get into a snow squall that temperature will drop down to 32 very quickly uh, and same thing you get that visibility down you get ice starting to form on the road with this quick accumulation and it's uh it's just a not good situation i do find snow squalls very exciting i was though, just gonna say that from a uh, meteorologist meteorological standpoint see them on radar they're, um, they're cool to watch like mike was saying a uh, uh, penn state yeah there it, it's certainly yeah obviously dangerous phenomenon obviously we're going to warn everybody about it but it's still a very interesting phenomenon just like a severe thunderstorm would be um so i i do find that like one of the rare things in winter that 
that is one of the more interesting things, at least for me, uh, when they when they arrive because it's so localized. It's like Very. <laughs> they can go from sunshine, yeah, and then ten minutes later you got yeah, zero right. visibility in the snow squall. You might have a snow squall that's you know ten fifteen miles wide max. And, and the sun's back out. Basically, your house gets the inch of snow and everybody else doesn't. And it's just like, hey, it's my own personal snowstorm. <laughs> right? Oh, man. You know, that's a good segue into the next uh, term here that I have for you guys. And you actually mentioned it a little bit briefly at the beginning. Well, I didn't um, want to steal your thunder. Oh. oh. You know, I but think I'm you fun. made this joke a while back. <laughs> I, I think actually I think I made that joke. So now you're just like serving it back to me. I see how it is. Yeah, that's. that's I, see, I see how it is. Well, no. you had all the bad jokes this podcast, so I had to throw one in. <sighs> that's fine. Anyway, <laughs> um, so yeah, the next term that we have here is uh, uh, thunder snow. And uh, if you haven't already noticed what we were going to, but thunder snow, yes, it's uh, it's it's a rare phenomena. Uh, basically, it sort of happens. Well, you got to think it's a thunderstorm in winter, kind of what Mike was alluding to. Um, basically, you know these uh, you know these storms that kind of go into these colder air masses in the winter time. A lot of lift. You, know, you got to think about how a thunderstorm works in in, in the summertime. Very similar in terms of how the structure is, just a little bit different in terms of, you know, how high these storms can get. But essentially, yeah, you just have a heavy snowstorm and and, and thunder happens. Um, they they do they they can get accompanied by, you know, hail, um, you know, strong winds. So essentially a severe thunderstorm in the wintertime. Yeah, I mean, and a lot of times these happen in what we call deformation bands in uh, major nor'easters where it's snowing so hard because the lift is so strong in that area um, that we get, you know, thunder and, and lightning produced. And they also happen in, uh, in, in lake effect bands too, very yes. intense lake effect bands because, again, you're thinking about where's that forcing coming from? Everything off the lake just, you know, hitting the hitting the terrain and you get these storms to pop up. That's kind of how lake effect works anyway. So you get a lot of lift in these storms, too, just like the deformation bands and in, in, in the coastal storms. So I think uh, and I think Jim Cantori, of course, he was the uh, I mean, thunder snow, of course, has been happening forever. But he kind of made it famous because he was doing a live shot and it's on YouTube. And I'm, I'm almost positive everyone that follows weather has seen it before. And I think it happened to him again. He was doing a live shot. You know, oh, look at snow and heavy snow. I can't remember where it was somewhere in the northeast. And of course, there was lightning and then there was thunder and he was just yeah. That, you know, he's like, oh, my God, did you, did you, did you, did you get that? Yeah. You know, so he's so excited. But, uh, yeah, it's uh, I think that's what really one made it famous times, front and center. One of those times uh, actually was in uh, Chicago for the yes. uh, Groundhog Day blizzard they yep. had back in, I want to say, 2011. Yeah. Um, but that might have been the second one. He's like, oh, my God, did, did that happen again? Yeah. Yeah. That was really cool. Yeah. Um, you know, it was cooler than that though if you remember back in 2019 in massachusetts okay there was a severe thunderstorm warning issued by the national weather service and it was during a winter you don't remember this it was a winter storm wow um yeah there was um i do think uh I yeah it, it was it's, a, it's an oddity because it actually had some strong winds with it but it was it was mainly being um uh issued for hail interesting yeah, yeah and and, kind of... and and ice um Thunder ice, thunder hail. Oh I mean, it was essentially a thunderstorm. Hard. I vaguely remember that. Though. It was yeah. a, it was a weird like I don't, I've never seen this in my lifetime. I, I've never heard about it, but it was just all the ingredients there just came together. Um, I don't know exactly I'll what storm. Be on storm. the lookout for that when I forecast for New England this year. Yeah, you gotta watch out for that. Yeah, um, but one other thing to to talk about here with thunder snow is it's not just doesn't just happen in the U.S. It happens sure. all across the globe, specifically in Brazil. In the southern parts of Brazil, I mean, just in the past couple of years, you know, 2019, uh, but not back in the 80s, 2005, um, they get thunderstorms and it's cold enough in the mountains and they can get some uh, some snow in there as well. Um, so, I mean, it's it's definitely not a phenomena that's just, you know, for the U.S. It happens in Europe as well and, and Japan. So mm. it's it happens across the globe, but uh, I think we just notice it more often in the U.S. because it happens so, so often. Especially now with social media and everything. Exactly. It's, everything's caught now on camera. You know, I have yet to experience thunder snow. I've seen thunder sleet here at the office in Haggettstown before. Close enough. We had a front coming through. 
I do remember that day. Sleet happened. Sleet um, hail. This might have been before you, actually. Uh, we're here at Weatherworks. No, works. we were downstairs. I remember. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Okay. We, we had the sleet and the hail. We're like, well, what does yeah, this count as? Yeah, we didn't know exactly what, does, what it was. Because we had sleet pellets, but then we had these others that were like bigger than sleet pellets. Almost, sleet. almost like pea size. Yeah. And they were very like uh, clumpy. It looked like uh, Cracker Jack. It was stuff a mix of hail, sleet, and grapple, I think. <laughs> so is it was it determined it was, as? Unknown UP, as you see in some of the airport codes, unknown precipitation. Um, well, let's end this podcast on something that's a little more calming. <laughs> uh, <laughs> let's talk about snow flurries. Yeah. Uh, I only put that in there is because I don't even know what the definition of a snow flurry a is. Flurry? We have an idea. I know what a flurry is, though. It's, it's an ice dessert. But that's a McFlurry. Oh, man. That's a, what? Mc, that's a McFlurry. Oh, I'm sorry, McFlurry. He, he, oh, my goodness. All right. Anyway, but snow flurries. Okay, so here we go. We have snow flurries. These are the things that really aren't going to cause much of a problem for people who are out commuting and things like that. Unless you are in a southern state such as Alabama, Mississippi, <laughs> well, Georgia, northern Florida, any flakes, people will go insane. Yes. Now, I would say typically if I was going to talk about snow flurries in a forecast, I am not expecting any type of accumulation. Right from a snow flurry um there might be several of them through the day a lot of times you have a lot of streamers coming off the great lakes from lake effect you might get a couple flurries flying through the air it's kind of like mood snow right i like to call it. it's like oh yeah it's nice there's a couple of flakes you know that sort of thing um if i were to see this on an airport uh, observation typically we're talking about a nine mile visibility something that is that means you can still see very far, even though there's a little bit of snow falling. Um, and I think that's my definition is that it's going to be a brief uh, period of snow with not many flakes at all. That's really not going to cause an accumulation on surfaces. Right. But when does that snow flurry transition to a snow shower? What's the different? Where does that light snow shower start? I mean, that's a tough one. Right. That's what I'm saying. I don't. Number of flakes falling. Yeah, I mean a snow flurry thirty five is not not going to do anything, but if right well twenty five and you get a few snow flurries, now, yeah, and, and then it does really depend on what the temperature is right. too. You brought up a good point because there is times when it was might have been in the single digits in New England where I was forecasting, and we had snow falling. It might have been an eight mile visibility. It's enough to coat uh, the ground even, but it was so cold that yeah. whatever fell so cold. Um, was creating a dusting on the ground and, you know, people would call up and say, hey, we're getting dusted. And it's like, it's eight miles. <laughs> you know, this is a very light but, snow. Yeah, January 15th and, you know, 18 degrees, yeah. it'll do that. Yeah, I think it has to do mostly too with, Mike, the uh, the fact that you have higher ratio snow, so you have more flakes and you're able to accumulate faster. Meanwhile, like a typical flurry is usually a mid-tier ratio, higher tier or lower tier ratio. You could see the flakes falling. You know, they're not minuscule. They can't build up quickly. And also your temperatures are not like so, sub-zero. So. I think the thing with snow flurries too is that we're not talking about a continuous period of this very light snow falling. If it's a snow flurry we're talking right. about, you're going to get maybe 15 or 20 minutes of this little bit of light snow that's right. coming Floating through. flakes. Um, we're not talking about, I think in the instance that I was seeing in New England, it was actually this very light snow that was just ongoing for a while it wasn't stopping it wasn't so i think that's also something you gotta think about with a snow flurry per se okay i still kind of want to get a mcflurry now well i mean it's nice i think yeah. we've exhausted our terms here and uh, we're exhausted with mike of mike <laughs> i'm exhausted with mike yeah we mike's getting upset <laughs> We're gonna have to Producer think about Mike. this. We're gonna have to think about this next time. We want to invite him on the program. Just remember all of these well, dad jokes he was spout, spouting. Didn't you out. invite me to the to the snowstorm podcast? Oh, that's okay. We like Mike. Come on now. He's he's that's a all good, right. I'll I'll find a replacement. It's okay. He's yeah. a, he's he's you a know good, what? He's a good addition to our podcast. You can when find he makes someone else to edit these episodes too. So. <laughs> 
you're welcome back anytime on the weather yeah, lounge. Yeah, really. All right, everyone. Well, thanks for listening to the weather lounge. Again, we'll have a new episode every two weeks, so please come back and visit. Also, visit our social media channels. Just look for Weather Works and just search that wherever you would like to find those. And also visit weatherworksinc.com to find out what our company does. Thanks everyone again, and we'll talk to you soon.